welcome to this plenary session. I'm Anna Staudal, a family doctor and university teacher in Oslo, Norway. A Wonka Europe past president and newly inaugurated president of Wonka World. And this is one of my duties on my first day as president. What a privilege. Selection and training of future family doctors. It couldn't have been better. I will be the moderator of this plenary session with two speakers representing the younger family doctors among us. They have both been active in the young doctor movements over the last decade. They will give one presentation each, and we hope that you, the audience, will engage in the discussion they provoke with questions, reflections, and your own experience. The title of this session is Selection and Training of Future Family Doctors, a fundamental topic. Let's start. And Nagwa, you are the first one out. Nagwa is Assistant Professor of Family Medicine, currently Wonka EMR East Mediterranean Region, Honorary Secretary and previously founder of al -Razi Young Doctor Movement. We are looking forward to your presentation. After your presentation, we will hear Ana Nunes Barata. She's a family doctor in Portugal, and she has served two terms as a young doctor representative on the Wonka World Executive. I wish you good luck with your presentations, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So off you go, Nagua. Let's play your presentation. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you in this plenary session. Uh, we are thankful for the host organizing committee for choosing such an important topic. Uh, and I'm glad to be with you with Anna. Uh, together we owe the future selection and training of future family doctor. I am Nagmina Shafiyezi from Egypt. First of all, we would like to ask why it's important to establish selection and training for future family doctors. And in order to answer that question, we need to dig deep slightly. We need to understand the health systems. Health systems simply, according to the WHO report in 2000, uh, simply had emphasized its old institutions, people and actions, whose primary purpose is to improve health. So the main objectives of these health systems is simply to improve the people's health and well-being, to respond to the people's expectation, to provide protection against the costs of ill health. So health systems are very important to achieve their target. So in order to achieve their objective and their target, we need simply to strengthen the health system. Why do we need to strengthen these health systems? Because once we are going to do that, all people and communities would receive a quality of health services they need without any financial problem. So SDG 3, which is health for all, is going to be achieved. Once it's going to be achieved, all the other SDGs are subsequently going to be achieved because there is going to be no poverty, the quality of education is going to be assured, there is going to be a gender equality, inclusive societies, and equitable health outcome and well-being, global public health security, resilient societies, plus inclusive economic growth and decent jobs. So, what do we need to strengthen the health systems? We simply need adequate, well-qualified health human resources. The adequate, well-qualified human health resources also need a presence of an evidence-based retention strategy. 
is crucial core for any health system to have adequate number. So we need an adequate number that is also well trained and having a good experience because it is the central point for delivery of the patient-centered health care. And this is going to be across the continuum of health care. In the health, in the human health literature, in the human in the human health resources literature, it occurred that there is a crucial and critical shortage of the health worker in many countries around the globe. This was specifically documented among physicians and nurses. And we can find that in the WHO statistics and this map that simply resemble the density of the physicians in the yellow color, nurses in the gray color, dentists in the orange, and pharmacists in the blue. This is 2019 statistics that is talking about the density of the uh, health workforce there 10,000 population. We are going to, need to, not to notice that there is unequal distribution of the physicians besides unequal presence of different health provider. We are going to find that the most of the physicians are in Europe, followed by America, then West Pacific, followed by east mediterranean southeast africa is the least one and looking for to the nurses you're going to find that the maximum number is in america followed by europe with a shortage of the number in other places that doesn't suit the density of the physicians now looking much more close into the medical doctors there are ten thousand population we are going to find that the light color resemble the lower density and the deep color the deeper the color the high the density is so this is the medical doctors there are 10,000 population according to the who and looking further close into the generalist practitioner number according to the who 2019 we are going to find that the numbers some places there's no data regarding that and also the lighter the color the lower the number and the deeper the color the highest the number the sustainability of any primary health care services had been challenged by the global shortage of the human health resources, which is exacerbated in the developing countries, as we see in this map. Looking into the stock of healthcare workers in 2013 and what we would like to achieve in 2030, we are going to find that there is much lower, much lower numbers and a lot of required physicians and doctors by 2030 to achieve the universal health coverage. So what is the solution for the health system? Alma-Ata Declaration, which officially launched in 1978, was launching the primary health care service. Because the declaration of Alma-Ata was called Health for All, and it was supposed to be attained by the 2000s, the goal required making primary health care the cornerstone for the health care systems, which is very important to achieve health for all. Primary health care remained a high priority on the international agenda, where it was the theme of the WHO report in 2008, now more than ever. Primary health care, now more than ever. This renewed the commitment toward the primary health care from the universal belief that is the most effective and efficient approach to maintain the population health and to prevent the disease progression. Despite all of these advantages and progression, there has been uneven and health care become more inequitable. The reason beyond that could be the concrete form of the Millennium Development Goal that, that had changed it later into the Sustainable Development Goal.
and the in emphasis and uh, importance of primary healthcare had occurred again with more structured uh, uh, interest into the practice in um, in the Asitana Declaration in 2018, where we are convinced that strengthen the primary health care is the most inclusive, effective, and efficient approach to enhance people's physical and mental health as well as social well-being. And the primary health care is the cornerstone of sustainable health system for universal health coverage and health-related sustainable development goal. That was the Asitana Declaration that simply and anonymously endorsed by the WHO member states makes pledges in four key areas to make bold political choices for health across all the sectors, to build sustainable primary health care, to empower individuals and communities, and to align stakeholders support to national policies, strategies, and plan. So we have health systems, we have primary health care, that is the key for the universal health coverage, and we have to empower the individuals and the communities. So we have health profession training. In, 19, in 2016, the WHO Assembly adopted the Global Strategy on the Human Resources for Health. It simply emphasized the necessity for increasing the investment to build a sustainable skill mix of health workforce to respond to the population needs. And the Lancet Commission also emphasized on the relationship of health profession education program to the development of a well-prepared workforce to address the needs of the patient and population. So training of the health workforce of the family physician is crucial and important in order to achieve the required goals of the universal health coverage. Universal health coverage cannot be achieved without a well-trained, motivated, and supported family physicians. And this simply was done in the Regional Committee for the East Mediterranean 63rd session, which is the RC63 that was held in September 2016. It was simply talking about scaling up family practice, progressing toward the health coverage. This is, was a report which was talking about scaling the family practice and the importance of having different bridging program to decrease the gap and have more qualified family physicians and health workforce. It was also emphasizing about the importance of the family physicians and the density of the family physicians per population, where the report had described that there are three categories of countries, where the first category had achieved the three family physician per 10,000 population. The second category needs strict policies and require major policy shift to reform the primary health care, increase the investment to establish and strengthen the discipline of family medicine in the region so that the required number by 2030 can be produced. Group three is much more beyond and they need a more strict and more advanced policy in order to achieve that change and more commitment from the policymaker. So training is important. We need to understand the training scope, who's going to do it, who's going to receive it and what is the approach. Who's going to do it is the universities and the academic institutions being the governing body and in the in the community and because it's their social accountability responsibility who's going to receive that it's the undergraduate and the postgraduate and it was noticed in different literature that 
exposure of the undergraduate into family medicine during their medical study is important for choosing the career later on. Postgraduate for continuous professional development and for helping them to achieve their the, 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 the policy and the objective of the health services. What is the approach? It's simply bringing the students into the primary health care communities, which is community based education and primary health care task force into the universities. What is the approach for the undergraduate? It's important to have a vertical undergraduate program with a fit for purpose that is aligned with the community needs. Also bringing the students into the primary health care communities bringing the task force into the campus, interact and develop. It's important to do scaling up for family medicine training program to increase the number of the licensed physicians. The discipline of family medicine training should be established and strengthened because the traditional way of training is hard right now. It's important to bridge the gap through different programs that can facilitate having um, an exceeding number of family physicians to achieve the plan of the health for all SDG3. Students need to be trained in primary health care, so they need to be trained in primary health care for primary health care purpose. Now, why students why don't students choose general practice or family medicine? There had been a report by choice, not by chance, by Valois in UK. It simply emphasizes of the revision of uh, 294 papers and reviewing them, a lot of points. One of them is why don't students choose general practice or family medicine? It's because of the hidden curriculum, less per stage, loss, less money and more depth by the years of the study, intellectual, under stimulating, adverse work condition, negative experience during placement. However, in the regional part, in the Middle East, it doesn't make a lot of differences because in a study that was done also in Iraq recently, why students don't like to choose family medicine, pressure of the care and practice, lack of personal time, office work plus dealing with problematic medical clients. So while asking medical students, why they don't prefer to take the specialty, most of them were thinking because of the less understanding by other specialities and lower awareness of the, con of the community. So the contextual part is playing an important role here for choosing the specialty. Literature over the past two decades has examined the escalating primary health care, human health resources crisis, elaborating on the centrality of recruitment and retention of primary health care, human resources for building balanced, effective and sustainable primary care services. Moreover, the rule of human health resources had been acknowledged to be more even, uh, more important in the community-based care, which tends to use less advanced equipment and is more dependent and competent personnel. We have a lot of high turnover. Why do we have a lot of high turnover in the speciality? It is simply because of job dissatisfaction due to the organizational characteristic. It's due to work characteristic and individual characteristic, organization characteristic in the form of the incentives, salaries, and work condition. Work characteristic due to the um, working hours type of the work, team cohesion. Individual characteristic due to the burnout, training and development, safety, digitalization, and privacy, which are examples for the reasons of the job dissatisfaction. However, some of people, some of physicians choose the speciality. Why? Because of the previous exposure to primary health care, which is 
which is, goes and echo in the study of by choice, not by chance, and study other and echo other um, studies. Uh, why they choose that? Because opportunity to teach, opportunity for research about the preference, perceived influence on the content, about the opportunity for the research, opportunity to work and deal with the case, about the emphasis of continuity of health, early exposure to the discipline, all of these ability to work with a wide range of skills and behavior, all these really important factors emphasizing the choice of family medicine speciality. A global picture of family medicine, which is a view from the Wonka story food, it's family doctors around the world sharing their stories about their profession and presenting heterogeneous picture about the attributes of the speciality and why did they choose that speciality. So it may inspire, it may serve as a positive example for family medicine program, prospective students, advocates, and other stakeholders. So our take home message, adequate supply of qualified human resources for health services had been highly correlated with better quality community health outcome. Policymakers need a recognized recruitment and retention policies and procedures for sustainable primary health care workforce and development. We need to understand that the selection and training is not one size fits all, and that contextual factor needs to be taken in consideration, depending on the local, national, and international contextual factor. Thank you. Hello everyone, so my name is Ana Nunes Barata, I'm from Portugal, and I'm going to follow up on my colleague Snagwa's presentation on the topic, Together We Own the Future. I really want to thank the host organizing committee for organizing this plenary. Uh, it's a very inspiring topic and challenging as well. And we hope that with this presentation and with this plenary, we can really inspire you and show you what family medicine can offer you. And, both, and most importantly, what we can achieve by collaborating throughout cultures, throughout countries, for the improvement of family health care. So, starting off with the definitions, uh, we already saw with NAGWA universal health coverage, primary health care, and looking back into the basic definition which is the definition by the World Health Organization. We can really see how primary health care is a holistic specialty. Because primary health care is care for all at all ages. All people everywhere deserve the right care right in their community. So it's a, a holistic care, a care of proximity a care that is accessible for everyone. However, if the World Health Organization already defines primary health care like this, why is there still some trouble in some communities to access health care itself? And this leads to us to another discussion, which is how healthcare systems are built. So basically, we have four big healthcare system models. So we have the beverage model, we have the Bismarck model, the national health insurance model, and the out-of-pocket model. So starting off with the beverage model, 
This one is a healthcare system in which the government provides healthcare for all its citizens through income tax, tax payments. So like this, the government is the single player in the healthcare system. There is no competition in the healthcare market and therefore the prices are kept low. Then we have the Bismarck model, which is a limited healthcare system where people pay a fee to a fund that in turn pays healthcare activities that can be provided or by state owned institutions or by government body owned institutions or even a private institution. Then we have the national health insurance model, which is driven namely by private providers. But the payments come from a government-run insurance program there that is paid by every citizen. Essentially, it's like it's an, it's an universal insurance that doesn't make a profit. And finally, we have the out-of-pocket model, which is the, the model in the poorest countries, uh, where it's basically either you have the money to access healthcare or you don't. So it's really based on the individual fund of everyone. Okay. So with this, with these four models competing against each other, uh, we can see that there, there is not an equitable access to healthcare system. And there is not an equitable access to primary health care. So the system itself can be a barrier for people to access primary health care. And then another issue, which comes to the definitions. So it's always the big uh, war or a big discussion about is it general medicine, is it family medicine, is it general practice, or even people ask if primary health care or family medicine is even a medical specialty. Because for many ages, primary health care physicians were the ones who finished medical school, started their uh, small clinic, they didn't know uh no university degree they did nothing and they suddenly just started being uh, the kind family doctor that went from house to house offering care uh, if we see the definitions the european academy of teachers in general practice uh, defines that there is a really a necessity to define both the def these disciplines uh, in which academic foundation and framework they are built. So defining this, we can really inform the development of education, research and quality improvement. Um, and so this is needed to translate this academic definition into reality of the specialist family doctor that works with patients in healthcare systems throughout the world. Therefore, general practice or family medicine needs to be seen as an academic and scientific discipline with its own educational content, research, evidence base, and clinical activity. And this is the clinical specialty orientated to primary care. So this really needs to be settled. And we really need to see primary health care as one of the most important medical specialties and the clinical specialties in the healthcare system. Because as we see, it's the base for everything. And it's the cornerstone. And again, even another point that I would like to raise is if we see family medicine or general practice, even the, how the, it is organized, it's completely different from country to country, from uh, continent to continent. So 
the activities, for example, you can have um, family medicine uh, practitioners who do routine visits, uh, same day visits, home visits, some don't do home visits. Uh, some uh, then the healthcare systems that uh, the health service that they provide for special groups like pregnant women, children, family planning, diabetes, hypertension. This is not everywhere the same. Not all family doctors provide care to pregnant women, not all family doctors to family planning. So even in our activities worldwide, there is a great number and a great variety. So this is another challenge again in the definition of primary healthcare and what we really do and how to form uh, what we need to be prepared for. Then the teams where we work in, there are family doctors that work solo. There are family doctors that work in a team with nurses, with social workers, with dentists, with psychologists, pharmacologists. So the team can be from one person to a multidisciplinary team for, with, with a big multidisciplinary integration of care. Then again, the settings. It, the settings also influence the activity of the primary health care. Uh, they work in the community. Do they work in schools and the retirement homes? Even now with the COVID wave, what was the role of family doctors during the COVID wave? Uh, did, we, did we participate in the vaccination campaigns? Did we only do, attend the COVID um, people that had the disease? So what? was our activity there and then the contracts the contracts are also different but that is also again dependent on the healthcare system where we uh, where we work so we have the state workers and we have the private insurance how do we work so if we work for the state maybe we have a bigger scope of work and if we work in a private setting we are the ones who define what we would like to work in. So maybe there is a more liberty in terms of organizing our own practice and our own clinic. And this impacts then in the curricula. The curricula of a family doctor or a general practitioner, it, differ it differs from continent to continent, it differs from country to country, and it differs from area to area. So if I speaking about area, I mean, what a, a person needs to be prepared for in a rural setting or in the city setting is completely different. So how really to prepare the young doctors for all these variables? We saw that there are many variables that define primary health care. And together, we really need to see and how to promote this variety and to prepare the young doctors for all these challenges that are coming forward. And last but not the least, there is also the question of social recognition. Uh, this is a difficult topic, but sometimes we already seen the people who choose to go and choose to opt for family medicine our colleagues that choose to opt for family medicine as a medical specialty, but sometimes it also has to do with the social recognition. They think that if they choose family medicine, they are less of a doctor than the other colleagues. But is it really so? Is it really to uh, feel that we are less than the others? Um, we work in a holistic care, we work with people from all ages, we are always there, we are there for the family. So it's really social recognition needs to start from us, from ourselves, from the young doctors, but also we need to work with the community. We need to also teach them and, and train them and tell them the family doctor is not just any kind of doctor. It's uh, the doctor of family, and the family doctor is a doctor with training, with a specialty, and who provides holistic care throughout time.
Okay. So all in all, now, and I'll question you, what is the role of primary health care? I invite you to, to think about this. Because we saw all the variables, but then we are the cornerstone of everything. So the primary health care is the most important medical specialty of all, if I can say so. Um, or in my view at least, but primary health care is really the cornerstone of every healthcare system. And it's the first access to healthcare. So the healthcare systems need to be built around primary health care so that we can have an equitable access to health care. But now we saw everything about the healthcare systems. And now I invite you to think out of the box a little. Sometimes thinking out of the box allows us to see new horizons. And we never know when those or how far those horizons will stretch. But it's having those horizons that inspire us to really look outside our practice, look outside what we do every day, and, and to seek new uh, possibilities and new and new collaborations and of course now <laughs> i need to start off all with wonka wonka the world organization of family doctors it's it's a special organization and it really is an organization that we cater for with all our hearts it brings us together it lets us exchange our knowledge and it possibilitates that we are here and speaking about family medicine and integrating our knowledge. And thankfully, there is the Wonka Young Doctors Movement. There is one, uh, one movement per region and they can be this first door for the world and for people to experience and for our colleagues to experience what is beyond their family uh, medicine practice, what is beyond their daily practice. So I'm sure that you are all familiar with the structure of Monka, but basically the Young Doctors Movements are a group and a committee inside Monka. And as said, there is one group per region. So we have Polaris from the North American region. We have Vasco da Gama movement from the European region, Alvazi from the Middle Eastern region, Afrikan from Africa, Spice from the South Asia region, Rajakumar from the Asia Pacific region, and the Wainake movement from the Latin American region. So as you see, there is one movement per region. And why are they so important? They are so important because they allow us to collaborate on a global network. We can exchange our knowledge in an intercultural setting. And then young doctors have the possibility to make our voice heard. We have national and regional representation, and we sit in Wonka executives, so we really can speak out to the seniors and to let our voice known. So the, the gains at the individual level are immense. Experience from collaboration can go from research, uh, healthcare strategies and initiatives organizing your practice, how to, you organize your practice, what can you learn from your colleagues, what, how they, they, have, uh, they have organized their daily settings, and most importantly, innovation. In the Young Doctors, innovation is the key for everything. And to innovate, 
I mean, we need to be a little bit like a child. We need to cater for this child's curiosity inside us. We need to ask, 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 and most importantly, be creative. So some of the results of this collaboration are the newsletter, the global exchange program, the Family Medicine 360, the global fund for the young doctors movements, the webinars that we did this year, and the, um, the forum to join the Wonka Young Doctors Movements. And this was the uh, collaboration between the young doctors, but it's not only us. We also stretch our collaboration further and look for external collaborations. And we developed Aspire. So there was the collaboration with the Aspire program, which is the Global Leaders program. We have the collaboration with the Rural Seeds which is the Young Doctors uh, Rural uh, Group. And we collaborate with the whole World Health Organization and also with the International Federation of Medical Students Association. So our scope is much bigger than we think. And reaching out this year, we have the first virtual World Young Doctors Movement Speak Conference, Embracing Diversity. I'm sure many of you attended it, and I hope you enjoyed it. But it was really important that even in this phase, we managed to organize a World Young Doctor pre-conference. So all in all, come together see what the young doctors allow you to do stretch your horizon don't stay only in your practice because together we really own the future thank you very much <laughs>
I'll try to answer this question. And it's a little bit like the elevator pitch. How are we going to market family medicine? Because that's always the challenge. Family medicine is so broad that getting it in 30 second message can sometimes be challenging to get across. But if I were to put it in one sentence, maybe it would be something like choose family medicine if you want to be next to the people, if you want to be, if you want to do holistic care, and if you are looking into doing a little bit of everything. Because family medicine is the specialty where we can't really say, this is not with us. Because if we go to other specialties, okay, ophthalmologist, you just see the eyes. Um, cardiology, you just see the heart. Uh, and they can easily say, no, this is not with us. Please go to your family doctor. So you are the person, you are the referral person to this um, to this family, to the, um, to the patient, because you are the one who can follow the whole process of, of life from birth until death. And you can always be there when he needs you. So maybe the best way to, to encourage young doctors to choose family medicine is really to be, to be there so that you are able to be the, the rec, uh, it's not recognition, to be the key person in handling the whole life of the person in front of you. Okay, yeah, let's move on from, from there because um, when we are building curricula in family medicine, you said something about that, Anna, in your presentation that the curricula should be, um, should be tailored to context. Does this mean that family medicine is the volatile thing which is different? whether it is in, um, well, very remote areas in low and middle income countries or in Lisbon, where you, uh, where you yourself practice, where, which is a high income country um, in Europe. Should the curricula be different for doctors who are, uh, will be prepared to work in those different contexts? Uh, the curricula, uh, I believe there should have a global standardization of the basic. So what is expected from a family doctor and including this holistic care. However, the, tail, the tailored part really needs to be also included in the curricula because, for example, if you take in Australia, where, where it's very remote areas, um, where people need to know surgery, where people need to know other competences that you don't need to know in, in Lisbon. But even in Lisbon, um, sometimes in practice, um, it also differentiates where you are practicing. You, uh, for example, in my practice, I need to have a lot of a look out into the social circumstances of people. And this should be included in the curricula. However, sometimes these things are not seen and the curricula is, is very lacking. So it's, it's difficult to do it, the, the basic competences all over the world, but there should be one base for everyone and then have it tailored and constructed around the necessities of the area. That is what I would suggest. What are your reflections, Nagwa, on, on this question? Whether okay. yes. as, a, yeah. as an academician, as, as a person who had this discussion with you, Anna, previously, I think we had agreed on something that um, uh, there are common principles that should be delivered so the principles there is no argue about that what the particulars are this is could be the contextual that can suit each place according to its needs 
So the principles, I think there's an update for the UNCA, which is the 10 C is the rule of the family medicine. Uh, so this is could be as a start of, and you have to unify the principles among the world in order to have a bottom line for understanding for all of us. And there could be something like 10% or 20%, which could be the particulars that are specified for each country or each context, because yes, we are diverse in practice, in communities, in needs. So this is, could be the specification that needs to be adjusted according to the needs. Hmm. And over to Anne. <laughs> okay. Um, another aspect of our topic tonight selection of colleagues to family medicine. What would be your list of criteria? Two, three, one, maybe, I don't know, maybe more. Characteristics of the person. If I'm now a young medical student and I come to you and I say, do you think I will suit um, family medicine? Do you think it will suit me? Do you think I can serve the purpose of family medicine? Uh, what would be your question to that person to find out whether you would advise him or her to take this on? So you can choose who to, to ask first, but this is, this is the real question. Who do we select and on what basis? I think this is a huge tough question, uh, Anna, because uh, selection is not an easy thing. But uh, as I said, that uh, the report which had been done by the NHS uh, with one of our colleagues, Val, she said there by chance, not by ch by choice, not by chance, is that the exposure of the students make their chances, uh, choices for choosing the family medicine specialty is high, and I do agree with that. And the matter of selection after they choose that specialty, because one of the important parameter is that they should have choose it first. I do not need to take them without them choosing. It's not they are not going to be motivated. So motivation for the specialty should be playing an important role. After motivation, then we can list a few questions like, do you would like to work with the community? What is your perspective regarding the comprehensive care? Checking the leadership skills, looking for the managerial um, um, issues, um, uh, searching a critical appraisal mind, uh, advocacy, and so on. But motivation uh, for that speciality I think is going to play rule number one and choosing and then selection. After that comes the other issues. And over to you, Anna. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Yeah, that was, uh, you, you managed to, to reply to, as you say, a broad question, a big question, uh, quite, quite, um, um, yeah. Um, now I, I, I don't uh, find the right English word, but it's precise, maybe, yeah, precise to the matter. Anna, what would be your uh, approach in such a situation? Um, maybe what I would ask the person is if they can see the patients as, I, would, I think this may seem a little bit uh, emotional, but probably if the person can see a patient as their friend. Because um, when you are a family doctor um, and you follow people all over their life, you, you build some sort of relationship of trust with this person. So it's not like it's your uh, friend that you hang out with, but you need to build this relationship of trust. Because if you cannot build a relationship of trust with your, with your patient, then you aren't a good family doctor. And also one important thing in family medicine is to be able to multitask a lot. <laughs> because we skip from one aspect to the other and we need to take care of everything. So uh, I would advise a person to have really this multitasking skills because it comes really handy in, in family medicine. <laughs> It, Those it, would be my two suggestions. <laughs> Anna, thank you, Anna. Um, it never fails when 
I mean, we need some time to 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 start the conversation. And here we have two questions, and that is what we we have time for. So we will be quick on both. Good questions. Uh, the first one from Maria João Nobre in Portugal. We are facing an escape of doctors, including family doctors, for other careers. What is lacking in family medicine to keep young doctors motivated in our specialty? I I suggest that goes to you, Anna, and Nagwa, you will have the next one. What's lacking, Anna? And you have now another pitch of a minute. Okay, uh, so what is lacking in family medicine? Maybe it's not the specialty that is lacking, but the working conditions that are lacking. Uh, so it all depends on not really what your actions are as a family doctor, but the pressure of the work the system puts you into. So if the system puts you in, in a lot of pressure, then you may be, be not so motivated to follow family medicine then and choose other specialties. However, if you can have a stable practice, if you can have um, a good work-life balance, and if family medicine is really a specialty that you love, then you will not choose other specialties. So maybe I wouldn't put it so much in the specialty itself, but all that surrounds it. Thank you, Anna. Um, one minute answer um, from you, Nagwa, to the question from Jose Miguel Bueno Ortiz. Together we own the future. How to see the future in 10 years? How will core values of family medicine prevail? Um, okay, I'll try to make it precise. Um, I was the first uh, family physician resident in my department a few years, I will not say when. Um, at, at that time, it was newly clinical, uh, under a clinical department, and it was the third in order in Egypt. So no one knew anything, and it was there was just only the health sector reform. I was very optimistic. And today, from my place, we have the universal health coverage and we have a whole sector of places where we have family physicians are working and people are competing instead of traveling to work in these places because of the high incentive there and the salary, the career pathway. So how do I see family medicine after 10 years? I'm an optimistic person. I think we are going to have a large number and I think the UHC are going to approach the 20, 30, maybe not as much as we are we need to, but at least we are going on the right way from my point of view. Thank you both. Let me try to, to sum up, which is not easy because this is an ongoing discussion and should be an ongoing discussion. Um, we've raised a few issues here, I think, which are very important to look more into and to develop um, a collective approach to an understanding of our role in the healthcare system, despite the, the, the local context. Um, so I encourage you, young doctors, to take part in that dialogue in the years to come. I very much welcome you uh, to do that. Um, I also have, well, this is something I all, always say when I meet, not less, let's not say young doctors, but younger doctors than myself, just some steps behind me in age and career. Keep the clinical skills. Be in clinic. Remember that is the core, whatever pathway you would take. And that is our main source of inspiration and understanding. We're there for people. Uh, I think that our um, technical hosts will be very happy if I now sum up, say thank you so much to Anna and Nagwa. I'm looking forward to meeting you again soon. And I hope that will be a physical meeting where we can uh, take this discussion further. If not, it'll be physical, it will be on screen and I welcome your input. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you so for much. your <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.